All right, the U.S. Open is uh, mere hours away. Joined now by uh, one of the best, I'm going to say it, one of the most prominent multimedia broadcasters uh, in the world of tennis and uh, other sports as well. Nick McCarville back on the show from the U.S. Open, covering it on site yet again. Nick, welcome back to the program. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk with you on the podcast. Also, it always feels like it's a big event when you're on the show. So uh, you got some <laughs> so to talk about. Thanks for coming right. back. Thanks, Mitch. I appreciate it. And before we hit record, you and I were talking about we already feel like we're on. I mean, I feel like I'm in day seven of the US Open and, you know, the, the main draw hasn't kicked off. I've been living in Flushing for a week already and fan week was unrivaled. I think the numbers uh, the next few days are going to prove that. But yeah, it feels like a true like festival carnival of tennis. And I think that's what, you know, the US Open's hoping for. Yeah, every year the last couple, it's just gotten bigger. There's been more attendance records set. It's the fan week. It's practices that feel like match crowds. You have the charity events. You have qualifying, which is a great tournament in its own right. So I guess I could ask you this question to kind of frame it. What do you think the U.S. Open does right? How are they nailing it, so to speak? Every year it just turns out more and more success. Yeah, I love I love our sport because I love how different the four slams are. You know, like qualifying week is so different, obviously, at Roehampton. Uh, at Wimbledon, it's so different at the French. The Australian Open, maybe it echoes a little bit of what the U.S. Open has done. But I love seeing the families, to be honest. You know, I, I've, I've been out there all week. We were doing a radio show for American Express that was broadcast on the web and on the app. And then I was hosting a few events. So I did two evening events and one day event on Friday and all that Mitch is fan facing. And, you know, things are expensive, right? Like we all live in this era of inflation. Everyone's watching what they spend and how they spend. And, you know, for families or for anyone who doesn't feel like they can do a $60 ground pass or whatever the ground passes are now, like, I just it's not bluster like it, just so many families out there so i think the us open does that really well zero dollars to get through the gates you know then you're paying you're paying 15 bucks for a sandwich or whatever it is um but that's that's kind of the trade-off and i think kind of the multi-layer approach to what fan week is you know qualifying is huge. I think for you tennis heads, you know that it is such a huge opportunity for people who are on the comeback trail or just coming up or, you know, 15 years young or whatever it is. Um, but then the programming in the evenings, the fan stage, the practices, you know, the fan access, the practices are just like, gosh, some of the pictures coming out from this weekend of these like absolutely jam-packed practices that's really cool for and even today i was on the long island railroad coming out this morning uh from my apartment in new york i stayed at home last night and uh you know people are like pumped to see practice like that you oh. know that's i think that's a chain that's a shift in our tennis and we have to understand that as tennis you know okay. as the tennis world we need to understand that people want to have access to this kind of stuff so i think the u.s open has gotten that right it has, uh, and you mentioned it, the families and just the kids too. I yeah. see, and, and I'm not the first to bring this point up, but it is creating those moments and those fans for the first time where you're right, it's expensive to go to big matches and not everyone has the privilege to do that. But when you see a player practice or just interact with the crowd, they're really creating those moments for the kids. It's, it's very special to see. And you touched on it too. I mean, playing in this event and just qualifying, Every year qualifying brings us new stories and storylines, and it's just so special to see what it means to these players that get to the main draw, especially when it hasn't happened before. You really see what it means to get through the door and make that main draw appearance. Yeah, you know, a, a couple moments off of that, like Diego Schwartzman was a big story this week coming through qualifying, you know, former top 10 the first day of qualifying that an email went out on our team, which is part of the court production team. And it was like, Hey, if Diego loses, like we're going to try to do some sort of ceremony for him on court. Cause we want him to speak. I think they had a little video prepared for him. He was on stadium 17 and you know, he goes on to win three matches. They can, they can push that presentation into the main draw now, but that meant so much to him. And then you look at players like uh, I was looking at Priscilla Hahn and what she's been through, the Australian player. Another Australian is uh, Lee Tu, the men's player. He had never actually successfully qualified for a Grand Slam. And on our radio broadcast, we were trying to hit all those big moments, especially on Thursday when people were qualifying. 
and he was down on the court like he had won the tournament. And that's wow. what it means to these people is to have the paycheck, that $100,000 guaranteed. That's huge, Mitch. And then, yeah, just the the moment, I think, again, the U.S. Open's done this the last couple of years where they've made a bigger deal to qualify or to get into the main draw. You get your ceremonial ball and a framed picture. And I think that's cool. You know, the slams have only grown. And I think it the sort of pomp and circumstance around qualifying should only grow too. It's exciting and it's good for Schwartzman, Schwartzman's case that we're going to have that moment, uh, his final U.S. Open, yeah. as you mentioned, uh, in the main draw. It's going to be great to Agreed. see. Uh, before we get to some of the other storylines, I did want to ask you and, and mention too, I mean, you're you know working as hard as anyone there. I saw some of the interview clips where you got to interview in front of fans, uh, speaking to some players in a much lighter, lighter setting, which is good. You also see how the players love this moment. They love to be, you know, talking in front of fans and keeping it light. Uh, Coco was one of them, a few others that you talked to. Was there anything that stood out or was revealing in your chats with some of the players in that cool, high energy environment? Yeah, so this is the third year we've done fan facing media day. So it's part of the car wash, you know it well, of where they come in and they do main press, they do ESPN, they do Sky Sports UK, they do any of their national broadcasters. I mean, you know, they've got five, six, seven, eight stops for the main players. And we have been added as one of those stops. So inside Ash, you've got a fan access pass and then you come and you can listen to, you know, we had Sinner, we had Coco, we had Shelton, uh, we had Francis Tiafo stop by, we had Iga. I mean, it, it was a, a really good um, batch of players that we had come through. Um, yeah. Did anything like super stand out? We Blair Henley and I co-host it together, which I know, you know, <laughs> but yeah. I, we try to keep it, you know, like she and I were prepping for it before we went on stage and I was like, Hey, like, are you going to line up two or three questions to ask them specifically about this? And she's like, let's just make this like chill. You know, like yeah. <laughs> we asked some of the players about driving. We thought it was kind of funny to get some insights on there. Like Francis said, he just got his license a couple years ago. I didn't realize that. Grigor yeah. Dimitrov told us that he, he likes to drive at a track, like a racetrack near his home. So it sounds like he gets some um, good adrenaline there behind the wheel. Um, I liked listening, you know, Jasmine Paolini came through and, her life has just changed so much. She played Cincinnati qualifying 54 weeks ago, and now she's an Olympic gold medalist in doubles and a two-time major single singles finalist. She said that she loves, she's like, I like being in New York and being recognized by all the Italians. Yeah. She's like, I'm having a good time. So I thought that was cute from Jasmine. Yeah, last year at the Cleveland event, I spoke with her when she was, you know, ranked out outside the top 50 and she was kind of working her way up and she was saying, yeah, I'm just trying to get some, my goals are to win some matches and majors. And then she makes two finals back to back. So Mitch, maybe uh, you're the good luck charm. Cause you were just telling me you interviewed McCartney Kessler this last week. I so did. maybe she's yeah. going to make a slam final next year. <laughs> maybe she will. And that's a, that's a good segue too. Cause I didn't want to give props to the players that won tournaments going into this week. Yeah. It kind of gets lost in the shuffle sometimes, but McCartney Kessler, we can start there. You know, 25 years old, which isn't a spring chicken for tennis players coming up. She's had to work tremendously hard. Nick, she got a wild card into the U.S. Open, was able to play this Cleveland event as a result. Takes out three seeded players, including the top one, Beatrice Haddad Maya, comes back in every single match. And for McCartney Kessler, who just had that moment of breaking into the top 100, this is a real monumental win and something that could, I would think, propel her to greater success on tour. Yeah, you know, we the, you touch on a few different points, you know, like what what is a wild card, you know, and, and for a long time, it was only developmental, and then it was saved for the comeback stories. And it's kind of taken on different and new lives of its own. But, you know, I think a lot of people feel as though McCartney Kessler was really validated in getting that USTA US Open wild card. And then, you know, you never know what week or what moment is going to change the trajectory of a player's career, not to say that the Cleveland title now McCartney Kessler is a, a top 20 threat, but it opens her belief system into I can win a WTA title. And now she's mm. going into the US Open as as a, you know, having a winning streak with that confidence and as someone who feels like, okay, I deserve, I truly deserve to be here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that. And I think, um, it's a, it's a tough one. The you know you look at like Dominic Team, Bianca Andreescu, they got their former champions, um, 
but the momentum that players carry from the week before, sometimes I feel like it's gotten now lost in the shuffle a little bit, but right. like we had Brad Stein in the radio booth this week talking about Tommy Paul and Lorenzo Sanago's coming off a win in Winston Salem and he's got he's got TP in the first round. Yeah. That's not an easy out. Yeah. And so if Sanago got in Saturday night, feels, you know, feels okay. It wasn't a super taxing. We obviously know it wasn't taxing against Mickelson in the final. But yeah, if yeah. if he comes up and feels like he's swinging for the fences against TP, yeah. that can be those can mm-hmm. be dangerous. And who won in Monterey? I think Naskova won in, in Monterey. Right. So yeah. there's another player. She beat Triantec in Australia. So why not give her an opportunity to have a deep run here too? Yeah, I think, you know, a couple good points there. One being that, yeah, when you play well, we see it in other sports too with uh, teams that like you know, NBA, NHL, even NFL, when you win a big game and don't have much time, you go to the next series. That first game, you feel like you're just in a groove. You don't have time to think or let the moment get to you. Musetti at the Olympics, right? He plays in that final, catches a plane, has to play the next day and gets the bronze medal. But I think, yeah, if you're, if you're in a groove like these players are, you can bring out your best. Also, you know, the talk about wild cards, Nick, I... I agree. There's no real, you know, no one really deserves a wild card. It's like a lifeline that can be handed out. But I do think in the purest sense, with all due respect to the great champions that have earned the right to get one and are, are big names, big draws, this is my favorite version of using a wild card, a young player yes, with, with some promise to give her a chance to get her development. And I think that really helped her in Kessler's case. So I'm excited to kind of see where she goes. Um, but yeah, I know. It's a, the the, yeah, the... <laughs> The wild card discussion is a tough one. I mean, I, I don't think there's like, well, a lot of people have pretty strong opinions on it. But even like we had Coco Vandaway, who I know works with you guys a lot in for Tennis Channel. And she was saying that she felt like she didn't get as, me, as many mm-hmm. or as much wild card sort of respect when she came back from it. She had some really traumatizing, <laughs> tough things that happened to her at close to the end of her career. And that's after she was a Grand Slam doubles champion and a singles semifinalist a couple times so you know it's it's always it's differing i do like it in terms of the system of like kind of anyone can ask for a wild card i mean not you know you and i couldn't ask for one but like if you're in the if you're in the doping system and you you've followed at least somewhat of the pathway that you can at least have that ask stan vavrinka you know can stan Mm -hmm. get hot at the u.s open this year um yeah but uh, it'll be cool to see some of the developmental opportunities i think that that we're gonna see and we saw some of that in qualifying too you know like some of these really the younger players who are Mm -hmm. trying to come through i love that there's the junior wild card and the ncaa wild cards i think those are cool parts of what the usta has done with open Right, and certainly shout out to uh, Linda Naskova for winning her first title at 19 years old uh, in Monterey, a big one there. Senego wins the title uh, in Winston-Salem out last Mickelson. Big for Senego. He gets to keep it going in the U.S. Open. On the Mickelson front, we have to talk about what went down in that yeah. match. Unfortunately, you know, hit the ball into the stands, ended up being allowed to play straight through. I'm going to preface this with saying I don't think Mickelson is a bad guy, bad kid, however you want to classify it. It was clearly a mistake. And it highlights an unfortunate part of all this, Nick, is that there is a subjective ruling into who gets DQ'd and who doesn't. I would like to see that go away. I think that's a common sense approach to this. Sounds like he probably should have and most likely should have been DQ'd in that situation. Yeah, I just hate making it the human decision where we're going on a case-by-case basis because... You don't have to look very far. You're at the U.S. Open where we saw a couple of years ago a player in Novak Djokovic get, get DQ'd for less. I would like to see subjectivity taken out of this entire situation. Yeah, and actually I was thinking we were talking about it today on our broad- you know, broadcasters get together before the U.S. Open. Um, does that rule actually state like if a fan is injured or what have you? Because that's kind of what they used. That's what they used when they disqualified or defaulted Novak from the U.S. Open in 2020. Right. But I think that, you know, it's a little strange that we're in a sport where that's been around for so long and that we have these like now there's like these reactionary like everything's like, oh, well, we'll take a look and we'll see what we can do. It's like, are we not thinking ahead on on a lot of this stuff? But yeah, I mean, I would say the same thing about Alex. I haven't had as many interactions with him, but I I understand him to be really respectful and I just I have a tough time, Mitch, from being on court and emceeing a lot where like I feel like I've seen this kind of systematic like 
how do you blow off steam? You know, like, well, right. why don't you just crush your racket? Like the only, the only person that's really going to hurt is the racket. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could damage the court, but I mean, players are, are put in these kind of like fishbowl, you know, boiling, sure. we're like putting the lobster in the boiling water. So yeah, I think it needs to be very clear as to what that looks like. I agree yeah. with that. And you just can't, we can't mess around with safety because no. whether it's an official on court, uh, a player themselves, let's not forget that they're, we want to keep them safe too. Um, yeah. And fans that it just, you know, the next time that happens, it, it hits a little kid or it hits someone right in the temple or I don't know. It just is like, yeah. it's great that it didn't severely hurt that individual. Right. But we are playing a little bit with fire, I think. Right. If you make a blanket ruling, like if you do this, you're out. It will definitely curb behavior, and it'll players will know. Okay, I can't even take the chance if I if I do this, I'm out. Yeah. And like, why will... was why was Nishioka like blasting like six balls? I mean, I'm exaggerating, obviously, right. to make my yeah. point. But like, why was that just like? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree completely. And you see, we saw it in the doubles match at Roland Garros last year, which was way less, and the player got defaulted. I just don't like that it goes down to what the fans' reaction was and also how the umpire decides to interpret it. It's not fair to them either. So uh, we'll see. But again, it was a great championship for uh, Senego as he moves on. Now, more with Nick McCarville here on Tennis Channel Insight. And I want to get to some of the round one matchups before we look at the bigger contenders. Uh, Mickelson gets, and Mickelson, I brought this up, he gets Baziri in the first round. We also talk about the crossover tennis appeal. Nick, how we got Matthew McConaughey tweeting about Ziri. <laughs> like he just loves tennis now, and it's great sticking up for his Longhorn. But he's he's all about it. First of all, like McConaughey is Matthew McConaughey, and the tennis tweets are hilarious. He was like all over Tom Tommy Paul earlier this summer, but that it's a it's a huge moment, and it's actually it's a it's really cool to see like. I think you could maybe argue Schwartzman uh, and Spaziri. I mean, pick a few other moments. This qualifying tournament was, there was a lot of great stuff that happened, but there wasn't like really any big standout moments. Maybe mm -hmm. that Joao Fonseca, Elliot Spaziri match, which was high quality. It was on court five. It was like total Thursday of main draw vibes. Like it was just yeah. so good. It's like the and, Olympics, too. You had like the crowds, the country mates, you know, Brazil's yeah, going to be there in the Americans. The Brazilians. Yeah, the Brazilians yeah. are always loud, aren't they? But yeah. Spaziri, you know, he's a local kid. He grew up in Greenwich in Connecticut, which is like 40 minutes from the NTC. And um, yeah, I think we, those are, that's a, another sort of cool takeaway is that the crowds were insane during Fan Week, even for the qualies. Um, I, I think, and I give him, I liked, I liked Sp Spaziri's game. You know, he's ranked outside the top 300. Obviously he needs to have the opportunity and he's earned his way now in. And how, how is Mickelson? I mean, that, that timeline is his text message inbox must've been crazy. How does he compartmentalize a kind of freak situation in his own life to now play a huge match in the first round of the U S open? It's going to be fascinating to see. Uh, one of the other matches that I wrote down, Nick, was Arthur Feast taking on Lerner Teen. Yeah. For those that don't know about this kid, 18 years old from Irvine, he went on a 28 match win streak, uh, you know, the challenger lower level, but got to his first main draw at Winston Sale, makes the quarterfinals. This kid is for real. And this is one where if you're Arthur Feast, do not take this match lightly. This could be a, a show stealing match in the first round because Lerner Teen's game is that good. Yeah, you know, Lerner Tien's a guy that, especially the last couple of years, all the American commentators, coaches, former players, people are really pumped about him. And now we're starting to see that come to fruition. And this is actually where oftentimes I feel like we complain about our, our systems in tennis, but let's give props to our systems in tennis. He needed to build confidence and has done so by staying at the challenger level, by winning these matches and beating really quality guys. Ask anyone inside the top 300. You feel like you can rally with Novak Djokovic or Carlos Alcaraz if you've got a 299 and below. So he's beating that caliber quality of player 
to win what did you say 28 matches in a row oh, yeah, that's yeah. insane <laughs> he's had an incra- crazy win loss and Arthur Fees has been he was the it guy in 2023 he's had a little bit of a sophomore slump he's also had some great results as well but that is you give learner tn if you're in the tn coaching box you give him all you pump him up obviously you set the game plan what are our expectations mm-hmm. and then you say listen you're in your backyard get these fans into this match and then try to play with his head a little bit. You know, the French are known a little bit to fold yeah. sometimes house of cards. Yeah. And I, I, I like too that we've got the American women have just been delivering so much. Now we're seeing the American men. We've got five in the top 20. It's huge. And we're seeing now some of this next generation. Who are these guys that are really going to join the like Shelton has certainly, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> uh cemented himself in in that group and so who else is going to join these next couple of years yeah on that american men topic there were some of the matches i wrote down for first round you have Sevi mm-hmm. corda taking on mutet which is a very very tough tricky matchup yeah. round one uh demon hour plays marcos garan who won his first title this year newport on the grass uh riley opelka back taking on musetti mm-hmm. and then you have hulk rune taking on brandon nakashima which could be a very tricky matchup too so if you yeah if you had any comments on any of those matches i know there's a lot of directions there but no there's plenty fun matchups yeah of course and and don't don't count out mackie mcdonald who has a lot of experience now of course the tennis isn't of the level of yannick sinner but everything that sinner's been through over the last week and the months prior prior, prior that we weren't privy to um, I, I give, especially if Mackie can steal that first set, you know, how is Yannick going to feel out on the match point? How's the New York crowd going to receive Yannick center? Um, mm. you, you named a lot of different matches. We, we had Marcos Giron in the studio for Amex radio this last week. And he, he just, I, I mean, I, I've interviewed Marcos a few times. I don't know if you have Mitch, but he's so yeah. nice. He's just the <laughs> sweetest guy. And like, he just was saying, like, I feel so lucky that I'm, you know, we were talking about the Olympics. We were talking about his title in Newport. And he was just like, I feel so lucky that this is my life, that I'm at the U.S. Open, that I have these opportunities. And he's playing a guy, Demonor, who, you know, had that really uh, unlucky injury at Wimbledon where he wasn't able to play his quarterfinal, his first ever quarterfinal. We haven't really yeah. seen Demon since. So I was, I asked him on air, I was like, sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot, but like, do you fully think about that your opponent hasn't played a competitive match in two months? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. I think about that. But also like, does that mean that he's fresh? Does that mean that he's hungrier than ever? So I I also think that, you know, throw, throw Garon in that hat. Like can, can the quad squad be able to get himself onto a big stage? I actually thought we were debating it on air. We had Bradley Klon and Mark Lucero in the booth with him too. And I thought that was going to be a Grand Slam match. They ended up putting it on 17. Um, And actually Mark Lucero thought, or we were even talking about it being on Armstrong, but I think it'll be a great atmosphere for that match regardless. Yeah, just a note on Marcos and agreeing completely with what you said. Uh, had the chance to, not quite as many as you, but talk to some some cool players. And he's the only one that emailed me a thank you like right away afterwards. No, so, a thank you? Yeah, that's cl- is, that's well, class. Years ago, so I'm sure he would do it again. But uh, no, <laughs> it was great there. And I think just the other thing to add on, be careful, Holger, because Nakashima's leveling up his game. And that's a, that's a, trap, that's a trap match for another reference. Well, and I mean, you know, Holger Runa just hasn't been able to bring like the consistent high level. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think that he's kind of found his stay in the top 15, top 10 to be pretty rocky. Mm-hmm. And Sam Query, Brad, Bradley Klon, and Mark Lucero were all talking about Nakashima this week in Amex Radio with us. And again, that's another guy who, you know, had a bounce a couple years ago, got up into the, what, the top 70, top 60. And yep. then injury issues, loses the confidence, has to go down to the lower rungs. That's why there is double A, triple A tennis. The money should be better. Yes. The condition should be better. Yes. That is a part of the conversation. But the way that it gives players, we were talking about Lerner Tien, he's on the come up. The way that it's giving Nakashima the bounce back, I think that's a real banana peel for Holger, Holger Runa. One of the other matches that uh, I have to mention, given what it means uh, historically and going forward, is Ben Shelton taking on Dominic Team. 
team got the wild card as last U.S. Open. It'll be a cool moment, but we know the draw doesn't really give out moral victories. It's a tough matchup for him. Uh, team getting the wild card here. I know we discussed wild cards here before, but it's good to see him on this court one last time at the very least. Uh, playing a guy in Ben Shelton who is trying, Nick, to duplicate the success that he had last year. Always hard, as we know, and we're seeing to follow up that initial success in New York. Yeah, I, I just, I mean, definitely Ben Shelton is the favorite over Dominic Team. I don't think either of us are saying he isn't. But how does Ben Shelton handle being back in the States, 50 more weeks of people knowing who he is, the the Shelton machine is real. You know, he's got the same agency as Coco Goff. It's Roger Federer's team. Like, the, they're trying to make these players superstars. So when you step out there on Ash, that's your lineup on Monday is Shelton and Coco in the afternoon session before it's Sloan and, and Novak Djokovic in the evening. And so how does he handle... And, you know, if you're Dominic team, maybe the level hasn't been there, Mitch, but you step out there and you think this guy has things to lose... And it does feel we had um, Dominic team at our flavors of the open, which is our food event. Yeah. It's for everything we're talking about, but maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> we had Dominic team the other night and he was just so relaxed, you know, like, I think he's just kind of like, this is kind of the end of end of the road for me. So I'm going to enjoy it. And he was nice with the fans. He was, you know, lending of his time. He was still the same Dominic team. He always was even as world number three. Um, so definitely give him a puncher's chance. You know, he's a former champion here. He's a, a four-time Grand Slam finalist. You don't you don't get to that level and play that kind of tennis without seeing that a opponent might be a little bit shaky in their own shoes. Can't wait for that one. There's so many good men's first round matches, as there are on the women's side, which before we get to Nick, unfortunately no on she bore this tournament. That was a tough loss for the event. She just hasn't been able to get right health wise this year. Uh, the former finalist. We hope to see her back, but it's just been a brutal stretch for her with the injuries. It's been tough for Ans. You know, I, I, I'm I'm with you. I'm everyone's disappointed when Ans Chabur isn't part of a draw. You just wonder now: Does she take a few months? Does she take the rest of the year off and try to get super healthy and fit? I don't know exactly how. It sounds like that that shoulder problem was lingering. And it was bothering her enough that she couldn't play at her top level. But then does it need an elongated, you know, those injuries can be tricky. So I, I really hope that we haven't seen kind of the like slow peter out of Anjabur. I don't know if we have. No one does. But yeah, that was that's definitely a bummer not to have her with us for the Open. Wish her the best in getting healthy going forward. Uh, the women's first round has three <laughs> matches, Nick, that I just, you know, I double circled. It's like, how did yeah. this happen? The draw really provided for us. Maybe not if you're one of these players playing each other. Uh, the first one, obviously, Nami Osaka, Yoyna Ostapenko. In the first round, quite the matchup, quite the contrast in a lot of ways, too. Loved hearing Naomi talk about how much she respects Yoyna, even though they're polar opposites in a lot of ways. It's going to be a real tough one for both, but I dare say that the winner of this might come out with some momentum, come out being battle-tested. Naomi's won this event twice, and she's getting, in many ways, the ultimate wild card, so to speak, in Yoyna Ostapenko round one. Man, you feel, you feel bad for the tennis balls in this one because they're going to be absolutely crushed. The women are playing with the regular duty. That was kind of a point of contention last year is that it was the extra duty balls. They're back to the regular duty balls. It doesn't, that doesn't favor either of these players really in this instance. But I was listening to Osaka's press conference before you and I jumped on, and I think it was good for her to get off her chest what she felt in Cincinnati um, or what she's been feeling for a while. She said she hadn't done kind of like one of those iPhone notes or whatever that she did where she's like, hey, I don't feel like I've been playing my best tennis. You guys obviously know that. This is why. I don't know why. This is where, I mean, it was very Osaka-esque. Yeah. But can you believe like she had match points on Iga Svantec in the second round of the French Open? And I just, it, it's, this is why the sport is so crazy. You know, Iga goes on to win that tournament and Naomi hasn't, I mean, she's had like little, she's had one right. step forward, two steps back in. And that's in terms of Naomi Osaka, four-time major champion. Yeah, that, it's, you know. like, it's like there's no, there's no, you know, participation trophy for almost winning or even winning one match. You go to the next tournament, you're all starting at the same level. So that was, we all agree it was an incredible performance, but 
and there's another match to play with a player that's just as hungry as you are. Yeah, I mean, Ostapenko obviously likes the conditions here. I, I she beat she she upset Sviantek as defending champion last year before bowing out to Coco and actually really brutal conditions. I just feel like if Osaka can really click into that next gear, it seems like they're close in a lot of ways. But for Naomi, if you know anything about her, so close is also very far away. So mm-hmm. she really has to see herself through believing, you know, and she has to open against a fellow Grand Slam champion. And and Ostapenko has proven herself. You know, there were a couple of years where we were kind of like, what, you know, what's going to be mm-hmm. of Yelena Ostapenko? But she is such a tough out. and. I just wonder if this could be one of those matches that like unlock something for Osaka, but man, I hope it's a good match. That's what it would be so great to see like Ostapenko, Osaka, just like it was with Caroline Garcia in the first round of the Australian Open when Osaka made her comeback. That was a really high quality match. And then as we've seen from Garcia before, she couldn't back it up. She doesn't have that consistency. It'd be great to see it it go i'll be biased here be great to see it go the other way for osaka and then be able to see her like really make a run to the fourth round make a run to the title you know make it feel like okay now i'm back to believing that i really can be one of the best in the sport certainly would be Uh, another matchup that that stuck out to me nick uh jasmine paulini bianca andrescu round one Paulini proving that nice girls in this case can finish first. Uh, but Andrescu is tough. To, she's won this tournament before, too. And that's, you know, we talk about the draw in the 32 seed and should we revitalize it? But tough draw for Bianca, to say the least, because Paul, Paulini is riding the wave. She's riding the wave, playing well. But again, it goes without saying we're going into new and uncharted territory at this tournament because this is her first year being in the upper echelon of the game. Yeah, I just. I have a tough time seeing Andrescu win, winning that match. I just, because Paulini now has like proven herself, you know, she goes to Wimbledon on a surface that she's not that experienced on and makes the final off of the French Open finals and then does what she did at the Olympics, obviously, with Sarah Rani. I think Sarah Rani has actually not been spoken about enough in terms of, you know, the. Yeah, the Irani of it all, like she really has been really impactful for Paulini. And I, I think that I, I don't know, Mitch, like what it actually all means, but Andrescu just has not been able to get her body right. And so it impacted her a little bit in Toronto. And then I was hearing this week that the body still isn't fully 100%. And Paulini is just such a physical player. So if there's mm-hmm. any, and don't, don't forget, like, sometimes I think we look at these matchups and like, these players are sniffing out every tiny little weakness. What's someone saying in the locker room? Did you see this tweet? What about this on the practice court? Like, this okay. is, this is real. They're playing for money and pride and titles. And yeah. I think Paulini now they've professionalized everything around her. She wants to go out and pounce on Andrescu. Again, like I said with Ostapenko and Osaka, of course you want this to be a good battle. Just feels like Paulini has like s- steeped herself well into the excellence that's gotten to her where she is. And yeah. Andrescu's gonna have to bring something extra special. I just don't I don't know. I don't feel like she has that right now for her it, on the tennis court. Yeah, it's going to take something special to beat the way Jasmine Paulini's played, uh, to say the least. And the other match I had written down, another just insane draw, uh, Zhang Shinwen taking on An- Amanda Andy Samova. Round one, Andy Samova makes that Cincinnati final, or makes that Toronto final, yep. takes off Cincinnati. Uh, has been playing better, is happier, we love to see that, but she's playing the reigning, confident, to say the least, gold medalist in Shinwen Zhang. So I'm excited to watch this matchup with Amanda taking on a gold medalist. Yeah, Anna Smova, I'll be curious to see how her form is walking out on court. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Zhang Kinwen, she was part of our media day. Actually, I interviewed her, and she it seems like she's riding high. And it seems like, you know, it, it does feel she's got a lot of handlers now. Like, it, she's oh. pretty media trained. But I, she's like, I now I know what hard work means. I, I'm, I've been to a Grand Slam final. I'm a gold medalist. She went home to China. She met the president. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I think she's kind of like gearing up to that next level where it's like, oh, I can, 
I know how to put these building blocks into place and I can be excellent on the tennis court. She did tell this funny story. I asked, I asked, um, Ken when I was like, do you like New York? You know, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes with these players that aren't from here. Um, you come to New York city, you know, Ega has been pretty outspoken. She does not a huge New York city fan. Right. And, um, Ken Wen was like, I, I love being here. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> last year I was on Armstrong and like mid match, I could just like totally smell like a waft of burger through the court. And she's like, I just wanted a cheeseburger, which is pretty great for her to say in, in English in front of American crowd and everyone, you know, I was like, I was like, Oh, you want cheeseburger or a plain burger? And she's like, I want a cheeseburger. <laughs> I just thought that was a good, like she's humanized. She's figuring out kind of that she can be herself, but also like you want an Olympic gold medal. I don't think there's any higher honor, especially for an athlete, but a Chinese athlete, especially in, in the way that that, culture sees the olympics um yeah. yeah i'm i'm pumped for that one too winner gets beat, a cheeseburger <laughs> yeah <laughs> beating ego to win that gold too on on roland garros's courts was amazing uh yeah. wrapping up doing some more here with nick mccarville on tennis channel insight and it's exciting to say the least if you look at the top of the game on the women's side as we kind of forecast this tournament you have ego as the number one player in the world but sabalanka coming off that very impressive cincinnati title Coco's looking to defend her title. Doesn't really have a lot of momentum right now. We've got other contenders in the mix and Jessica Pagula. Rabakina working with the new coach, other names out there. So looking at it from, from the top down, do you kind of see it the way I'm looking at it? Like Sabalenka's in pole position right now, still to be decided, but that Cincinnati tournament was kind of a warning shot. It felt like a warning shot, yeah. I mean, I'm hearing that Cincinnati, at least conditions-wise, was playing much quicker like the u.s opens giving kind of medium fast and actually the review from qualies was that it was playing a little slower than last year um yeah i'm just i just pulled up the draw sheet as you were talking about it you know like a potential zhang can win in the quarterfinals who's Sab oh sabalink has maddie keys in the fourth round should she get there it feels like you know, Sabalenka just had, she, she, uh, you look at 2023 and she made every major semifinal. And then are, do we say that it's disappointing that she only won one major last year? Oh well, yeah. And, that's the thing is that it's like, she was the most consistent player yeah. in majors. She only won the one title. One. I just, the way I forecast that is obviously anything could happen, but right now the most consistent player in majors has been Sabalenka. Coco's dealing with the momentum issues and they're not playing well and egon yeah. hardcourt's still great but obviously you have to look at her separate from the clay dominance so i think i think the way it's shaping out i think sabalenka deserves to be put in that top echelon it's it's, it's really coco I, I don't, yeah I'm curious about it, you know yeah coco i mean you know she opens against gracheva and then potentially in the third round against fidelina mm -hmm. i i just and coco even told us during that media day that you know, she still kind of gets those butterflies walking on court. She doesn't really want to look at the crowd. It's going to be a whole nother level. I think they probably asked for a daytime match to start her off just to get a little bit of um, consistency. I, I haven't picked my tournament winners yet. I, I, I'd have a hard time disagreeing with you on Sabalenka just by form, by majors. You know, she opens with Priscilla Han, who's not an easy out. But then you've got Bronzetti or Sun, and then yep. it just is going to take someone like a Madison Keys, like a, a Vekic is in that part of the draw, Yastremska, and then we talked about Zhang Kin Wen. It's mm. going to take someone playing their best tennis and Sabalenka not playing her best, so which can happen. They certainly can. the The other name I wanted to throw out, not just because it would be a rematch of if they were to play, but Pagula has been playing well. Jesse Pagula has been playing well, and that final did not go her way. But you know, she won every other match in the lead up with winning the title in Canada and then going to the final. She's someone that I think has kind of found her groove is healthy again, which is good. So she's another name I would throw into the mix. You got to look at the Americans mm -hmm. on the last dance for Danielle Collins, who you know gets the first round match with Dolhai, but after that, we'll see where. The draw leads her, but you know, she's not going to fear anyone out there. So no, <laughs> there is that. She's not. She will not. I, well, I mean, you know, Pagula opens with Shelby Rogers, who's also going to say farewell mm -hmm. to the sport soon. And then you get the winner of Radakanu and Kennan. So those are two, 
those are three experienced potential opponents for Pagula. And I was just looking at Pagula's bio. You know, she was with us on in this media day. And that quarterfinal, I just, until she gets herself into a major final four, I'm just, let's speak facts. Like she's not a threat to, she, she has to get into the final four and the tennis is there. You know, this is Fiontech's part of the draw. So potentially she has to go through Iga if they both make it to the quarters. And I, I, I love Jesse. I, I respect her tennis. She has, she has, it's crazy to think that. She played her first U.S. Open main draw at 21 eight years ago, and now mm-hmm. she or 22. You know, Pagula is there's there's just so many opportunity, so much opportunity for her to to get there. I wonder if she's. I wonder if she has to tap into something different, Mitch. Like, is it is there anger there at the Olympics? We were talking a lot to. Adam PD and to Caleb Dressel in the pool about swimming angry, but swimming controlled. Does Jess Pagula need to take some of that from that, you know, her NFL sort of roots and her family and find some fury or maybe I'm completely off. I don't know, but I, to, to really talk about her as a true threat, she's got to get into the semifinals. Women's side is shaping up nicely. Uh, you'll have Sabalenka there at the top, but if Coco could find momentum, she's done it before. And Ego always yep. dangerous on on hard courts as well. So can't wait to see how that goes on the men's side and the topics of contenders. Looking at the three players that have separated themselves mm-hmm. from the field, you got to see Novak Djokovic return to the tennis world after a much deserved celebration, winning the Olympic gold medal, which he proudly presented and displayed walking <laughs> into uh, the U.S. Open, but. What do you, where do you think he's at going into this tournament? Because you know when he's in an event, he's in it to win it. But he's got this sense of completion with all of his goals. The Olympics was the last thing that he hadn't won. Now he's literally won everything. So I'm curious your perspective on where you think his mindset is going into this U.S. Open. I don't think it changes that much. Like, I, I mean, I, I'm, that's not, and that's not even trying to have a hot take. Like, I think that it meant so much to him to win that title, but like, I don't know if Novak would have felt like he had to prove himself further if he didn't win the Olympic gold at the U.S. Open, you know, like because it's such a different stage. And I just there's too much. I was listening to his press conference as well before earlier this afternoon. And, you know, it just is like I come to every tournament wanting to win and he's done it for so long. You know, he's talking about his memories of coming here playing a rainy junior U S open in 2003, where they were like bus to um, Westchester County to play their matches indoors. You know, I, this guy has been, he has straddled. Now you can argue someone was asking him about the rivalries. Now that he's building Carlos and Yannick obviously bubbles to the top, but he's like, Oh, well in the generation previous. And I thought he was going to start to talk about Novak, Andy Roger. And he yeah. starts to talk about Grigor, uh, Stephanos, yeah. Daniil, and Sasha. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wait, that is a different generation. Yeah. Like, this, that's crazy. So it's, yeah. what, four or five generations now that Novak is spanning. And I just, I, not that the, the gold medal, it means a lot. He said, he, his words impressed were, what means the most to me is the Grand Slams and playing for my country. So mm-hmm. wins the Olympic gold for Serbia, says he never felt those kind of emotions on a tennis court ever, which is crazy to think of Novak Djokovic. And then comes to the U.S. Open, and I just think he's playing with house money, don't you? Like, I don't feel like do. he's... I just feel like he is like so good. He is Novak. And now he's kind of like, all right, I'm going to win this too. Like, I don't, I don't feel like there's, I don't really feel like we have to make it more complicated than that at this point. Yeah. He's so process oriented too, that, you know, he's coming in and he knows exactly what it takes to ramp himself up. The draw was very good to him. I would say center and Alcaraz on the other side, you can get that Ben Shelton rematch in round four this year, which would be fun. If they both get there and the other two top contenders. Yeah. And I, I, and I loved it last year when that happened, everything about it. Uh, but Yannick Sinner coming in, given what he's been through, we don't need to rehash everything, but how he handles, as you said at the top of this, how he handles the moment, how he handles the outside noise, how he handles the crowd is going to be key for him because he did win the last hard court major. He's number one in the world for a reason, but this is a different environment and a different type of challenge for him. Yeah, and he just won Cincinnati, right? You know, playing some really good tennis. And it seems like maybe he's healthy again after having the illness and the hip injury or hip issue through much of the spring and midsummer, missing the Olympics, which was big. 
Um, I think it'll be very interesting how, you know, I said it earlier with the Mackie match. I don't, I don't think Mackie McDonald, is he going to be Yannick Center in the first round? That's a huge ask, but it, you just never know how they're going to handle it. I just, I also don't feel like the New York and this is, I'm a New Yorker. This is no disrespect to the New York crowd, but like, I just don't think that there's enough people slinging honey deuces in the three hundreds that know about Yannick Sinner's That's doping fair. situation in the last week where he's going to get like absolutely rained down with booze. Like, I just don't, I, I really don't he think that's like he, didn't slide, like he didn't slide an American or, or something like that. It was, you know, yeah, I'm with you there. His reputation still does. I mean, this is an interesting one for it, but it, it speaks for itself. Everybody likes him and he's built up and built up in the goodwill to do this. Yeah. You know, the other guy too is Alcaraz and we're glad that his ankle is okay yeah. after the knee slip. Fine. Definitely seems fine. What's at stake for him? And I know he had the rough beat in uh, Cincinnati to Monfils where he wasn't normally himself, maybe the lingering effects from the Olympics. But if he wins this U.S. Open, Nick, we're talking a three-slam year, and that's a transcendent season. That's the short list. So if he wins this one, which a lot of people are picking him, he puts himself in, again, for this kid, especially if he goes without saying, just uncharted territory. Yeah. I'm looking at his draw, too, while you, while you give some of that background. I mean... I don't, you know, Shapovalov, actually Botik Vanden Zanskulp could, that's the winner of, he gets lead to the, actually the um, Australian qualifier I mentioned. I, I kind of think, Mitch, I don't know what camp you're in, but, you know, that, that Olympic final was a situation he had never faced before. I think Novak's experience, I mean, the tennis was really good, but Novak's experience was really great. And I think that it was Catherine Whitaker asked him about his emotions after that match in press. And, you know, Carlos said, I, I've never, I've never faced something like that. So mm -hmm. I, I think that it was almost good that he <laughs> lost to Monfils and he was pissed, you know, and mm -hmm. like, good. Like, I hope that Juan Carlos Ferrero took him out to Applebee's after that and was like, listen, we're in Mason. This yeah. is a huge event on the ATP. We're about to go play the U.S. Open. Like you're yeah. the Olympic silver medalist, have pride in that for your country. And yeah, I mean, what it could be Corda in the fourth Corda round. Four. Yeah. And then <laughs> you've got Diminor, who we're not sure how his form is. And then her catch, no disrespect to Hubie, but he just hasn't been able to slice and dice these biggest, big boys on the biggest stages. So I think it looks good for Carlos. And I think that he's just a kind of athlete. We're, we've been so lucky in the sport, we've seen a lot of really talented amazing entertainers and carlos is just a whole nother beast yeah and i think that he's gonna bring that beast mode to the u.s open they have built him he was on the <laughs> practice court he didn't come to our media day but he was on the practice court when we had when we had sinner actually up there and he's got five guys out you know he's got Juan carlos ferrero he's got his physio he's got another physio he's got his brother yeah. I just think that Carlos Alcaraz is this like once in a generation talent. And I would be shocked. I would be shocked not to see him in the final four, right? Like I would be shocked not to see him and Sinner in the semifinals. That would be absolutely incredible for this tournament. We've seen it before and it was one of the matches of all <laughs> yeah. time. And also he's built to go deep. We saw that U S open title run winning five setter after five setter. Uh, one quick note, too. You mentioned Alcaraz and, and turning the page on a loss, which we expect him to. You brought up Brad Stein earlier. He told me a story when he was a guest on this podcast about mm. coaching Jim Courier, thinking <laughs> that he, his job might be in trouble when they lost early in the tournament. And Courier met him at a diner and was just like, it's okay, even the Lakers lose games. <laughs> so it's part of the, I think it's I part that. of the, uh, the way it works is you have that perspective that everyone's going to lose. We've got bigger fish to fry. Yeah, uh, Nick, yep. this has been a great chat. The last thing, I mean, other men that can make runs. We haven't talked too much about the Americans. Francis Tiafo, Cincinnati finalist under the lights at, in New York is always a great thing. Taylor Fritz with an opportunity. And even some of the non-Americans and Zverev and Medvedev have a chance to find the final and make a deep run yet again. So anybody out there on the men's side who you think could be poised for some big success here? Yeah, Mitch, I, I totally agree. I just, you know, having Brad Stein, he said... With TP, with Tommy Paul, the goal is to go one round further than they have at a major before. Well, Tommy Paul's been to a major semifinal, so they want to get into the final. You look at Taylor Fritz. I mean, he's he's blinging, baby. There's a there's a lot of sponsor dollars floating around. That necklace was expensive. 
Yeah. Also, shout out to Blair from doing, we sat down with Jessica Bagula and Taylor Fritz both. And I opened asking Jess about her jewelry thing because she was in the West Village the night before. And Blair, Blair was like, well, let's say on the jewelry topic with Taylor, is that a Tiffany necklace that you've got on? And sure enough, I don't even want to know how much the necklace was worth that he was wearing. But all, all fun aside or all bling aside, you look at Tiafo, you look at TP, you and even Sebi Corda, you know, Corda hasn't Corda hasn't he, have been as consistent as these other guys, but I love Francis working with David Witt. I think that's a huge get. You know, sometimes these personalities just work together. I think David Witt's a good person for Francis Tiafo to have. Um, Mike Russell's done an insanely good job with Taylor Fritz. I sometimes don't feel like he gets enough credit. Brad Stein has been a czar with Tommy Paul. Again, if you've ever, you you know him, Mitch, Brad Stein's a, a fascinating character. So I, and I also love, like you mentioned, you've got Medvedev, you've got Rublev, you've got uh, Sasha Zverev, all of these guys kind of floating around who, and Grigor too, like you've got all of these guys who have a legitimate chance of going deep. I think that we could be in for a really great, us open in terms of storylines and quality of tennis hopefully the conditions stay like not too brutal i think the forecast is pretty decent like good new york summer days and we don't hopefully we don't get crazy humidity um yeah. but let's go baby last grand slam of the year i can't wait for it. two weeks of tennis start on monday it's going to be electric i know we're already some of the tennis heads yourself are already a week into this so we're already <laughs> yeah. fully revved up to go but U.S. Open 2024. It's going to be exciting. I can't wait for it. Uh, Nick McCarvel, really appreciate you joining the show. Uh, we spent uh, a lot of time priming everybody for a great U.S. Open. Uh, best of luck covering it. We support all that you do here on this show. But thanks for joining Tennis Channel Inside, and it's always a treat. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks. <laughs>